I'll tell you one thing uh, <laughs> that I found out. Tesla lies. You, you probably don't believe this, but Tesla lies. They understate continuously, continuously. We've been doing testing and whatnot. And uh, they say, oh, yeah, we're using this. And then we go over with our little spectrometer and go, beep. Oh, no, it ain't. That is uh, super deluxe stuff. I mean, they, they understate a lot. Hey, I'm Steven, and this is Solving the Money Problem. If you're new, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. So in this video, I'm gonna be playing a few clips from a recent interview, Now You Know, did with the automotive expert of automotive experts, Sandy Munro. This stuff doesn't react like that. Watch this. The interview is absolutely chock full of insights contrasting what Tesla does and doesn't do, plus how they think and their internal culture versus the rest of the wider automotive industry. And I tell you what, it's a pretty lopsided affair. So let's see what Sandy had to say. And by the way, guys, link in the description to the full interview. I highly recommend you check it out. Let's dive in. Hey guys, if you'd like to help out the channel and get up to two free stocks, check out the links in the description to Weeble and Stake. Let's get back to it. We looked at the difference between the Tesla 3 and the Tesla Model Y. There's a ton of things that we suggested that they put in place. We gave uh, an Excel spreadsheet to um, uh, one of the fellows at Tesla, and it had 250 uh, suggestions on how to reduce cost or how to make the product easier to build and whatnot. Some of them were really obvious where I really panned the, um, the back end of the Model 3 and said, this is ridiculous. It was over 100 parts and operations that, uh, that were going on, and who knows how many different kinds of fastening. I said, this is baloney. This should be one part. And then there was the, the bucket, where uh, the trunk bucket. And uh, I said, this should be you know a plastic case. And so when we got the car, you've got uh, two parts, the two massive parts, the, uh, the two mega castings. And then you've got a couple of uh, brace brackets that hold the two together and a few fasteners and boop, you're done. And not only did they take care of the stuff that I said should be one part, they actually incorporated the, uh, the, the uh, shock mounts and spring mounts and the suspension uh, uh, locations. And I mean, all kinds of stuff came when they went and did the, uh, the, the mega casting. And, and the, uh, the bucket actually was made out of plastic. I, I loved it. In fact, we, uh, we were talking about it and I said, and this is the way I wanna, I wanna have uh, things assembled. And I just threw it and it just blah, 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 and it went right in. I mean, it doesn't get much easier for an operator than to just toss the parts together. Actually, we did that three times and it worked every time. So having something like that, that's, that's good design. So I'm, I'm really, uh, really pleased with the amount of work that I saw done on the, uh, on the Model Y. It, uh, it makes a significant difference. This is a really fascinating point from Sandy. Not only did they provide Tesla with some ideas for improvement and whether or not Tesla was working off their list specifically or figuring this stuff out themselves, who cares, whatever, doesn't really matter. But the point is, the Model 3 to the Model Y, Model Y is almost version two of Model 3. The fact that even just the rear mega casting has suddenly made hundreds of parts and processes, remember they need to be attached, etc., disappear, amazing, and we're just getting started. We can infer from this a lot of things about Tesla, the fact that they will continue to improve and optimize throughout their processes, whether it's their vehicles themselves, the materials, the manufacturing processes, the design, everything. Let's see what else Sandy had to say. Is that a normal rate of change? I mean, like you had all the suggestions and you saw many of them implemented, but in your career with Big Auto, is that normally that fast that they would be able to implement them? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, normally there's uh, change boards and all kinds of things that would have to go through. But I can tell you some things that, uh, that I know were done that made huge changes to the Model Y that were implemented on the Model 3. So that kind of running kinds of changes where, hey, I think we should do this differently or hey, why don't we take some advice from uh, some of the owners or maybe Monroe and let's do this. And implementing them as quickly as they did, that doesn't happen. That'll get you fired. Um, uh, there's no question about it. By the way, I know about getting fired. I was fired three times at Ford. They hired me back after, uh, after somebody else proved, well, actually, I didn't actually get the boot out the door. My immediate bosses wanted to fire me three times for uh, what I thought for, were good for being ideas. Right? Uh, you're not, there's a lot of stuff you're not supposed to. Okay. So I, uh, when I first went to Ford Motor Company, I didn't, uh, there weren't a lot of computers and I, uh, I was working at engine division and I found out, uh, how to, I bought my own computer actually. And I brought it to work cause we didn't have one there. So, uh, so anyways, I found out, Hey, you know what, if I push my, uh, you know, one of these, uh, coax cables into my, my computer, um, 
uh, I, I can get to the finance page. And if I get to the finance page, I can find all the money that's left over from these projects. And if I can find that and I put enough of them together, then, you know, take them from this column and put them into my column, then I could buy a whole new machine for somebody who's got a problem on the factory floor. You can get, you get fired for that one. That They didn't like that at all. Uh, there was a lot of problems with that. And then uh, I still at engine division and uh, I went to Cleveland and they were having a lot of problems with cylinder head bolts. And uh, so I said, well, what you need is a feeder. Well, we tried, we can't get it. Really? So I was a machine tool designer before I went to Ford. So I said, I'll draw it up. <laughs> so I did. I drew up a, a feeding system so it would eliminate like four or five guys on the line and uh, make it so that the bolts would drop in automatically and whatnot. But then you got to buy all the parts. Okay. Uh, they didn't have any money for buying parts. So another thing you're not supposed to do, I bought spare parts. So I bought a great big giant hopper, which will never wear out, but I bought that as a spare part. And then two or three, four actually, four inline feeders. You're not supposed, they never wear out. Uh, then the feeding equipment and on and on and on. So it was all built with spare parts, uh, parts that we bought from uh, suppliers the, uh, in that community. So anyway, I got it all done and it's working. Uh, we did it over a holiday. I can't remember Easter or something like that. And uh, we're standing there watching it and the plant manager drove by. <laughs> he said, ah, what's that? <laughs> he almost dropped a cigar right out of his mouth. He was, very, <laughs> he was very surprised to see that there was a new bright green machine up there. That'd get you fired. And I, I don't want to go on all the stories, but at the end of the day, you can get fired a lot, lot of different ways by trying to do the right thing. Oh man, this one answer is like a microcosm of everything that's wrong with the current automotive industry versus Tesla and why Tesla is literally pulling away with an unassailable lead and no one is going to catch them. And this one really hits close to home too. Time for a little bit of a story. So many moons ago in another life, I used to work as a web designer, graphic designer and web developer. I started a new job. There was a couple of empty desks and spare computers. So I asked around a couple of the guys working there, what's with the computers that no one's using? And they explained that they'd recently been super busy they'd hired some freelance designers bought new equipment and everything just for the designers but they'd got through all those projects and they were no longer working and everybody had just a single monitor so I asked why don't you guys use dual monitors one guy there says oh I don't use them I just I've never tried and the other guy said yeah we should do that let's cool good idea so I take a monitor set it up for myself take a monitor set my friend up in the office awesome we're working more productively great then the boss walks back in from his lunch break wanders over to me Steve mate what are you doing mate What's this? And I explain. Oh, I've got a second monitor set up. I spoke to the guys. No one's using them. They're just sitting around. I'm way more productive, so I'll get a lot more done. So is my friend over here. So yeah, cool. No, mate, you can't do that. That's not, we don't do that around here. It's not your decision to make that. So you're explaining to me that it was a bad decision for me to try to work more efficiently for you. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, mate, authority here. You don't just go do that. You have to come and talk to somebody. I did talk to somebody. I asked the guys, is anyone using these? No. Okay, great. I'm not taking from anybody. Would anyone else like to set up a dual monitor? One says yes, one says no. Great. I set them up. What's the problem? Formal warning on my first day. Yeah. At that point, I wanted to face palm through the back of my skull. And guess what? I got two formal warnings at a job, but I was working on my plan B, eventually started a finance business and left on my terms. But guys, girls, this is a major warning sign. If you ever hear a company talking like this, having these boneheaded, stupid, completely illogical systems, orders, chains of command, when reason and logic do not win, you've got a problem, the company's got a problem, and you should be working on your plan B, C, and D because that ship is gonna sink. Well, and that is the difference, right? Because Elon talks about how he, he rewards that kind of behavior, whereas it does sound like big auto doesn't. Actually, you won't find any companies that are really thrilled with having a wild dog um, helping out. OK, so uh, it's very, very difficult. Now, I will tell you one thing. When I started the company, almost everybody that came here was one of those kind of guys that got fired. And so um, uh, Dan McCarthy was being let go. He was the first guy I hired in. Tom Short. He uh, quit before they fired him. I mean, all the old guys that, that started, well, they were young then, but uh, everybody that started with Monroe uh, was, uh, was a wild dog. And that's what you need for innovation. But if you're looking at a company that's got, you know, rigid rules, we have to do things this way and no other way. And we've got all these cadences that we have to adhere to and whatnot. So uh, it's a little different. Um, they're just trying to keep it so that they can keep everybody in line. But Tesla doesn't work like that at all. Sandy is a wise man and no doubt most of his staff are on the autism spectrum. Shout out to my fellow Aspies.
And for real, Elon Musk has literally said, if your job is to innovate at SpaceX, Tesla, whatever, and you do not do that, you do not take risks, you do not make mistakes, you do not innovate, you will be fired, okay? You literally get fired for not trying to innovate and improve things at Tesla versus if you try to innovate and improve things just about anywhere else, you get fired. This is why Tesla's winning. They have an innovation culture. Logic and reason win, and that's why Tesla's going to win. Everyone else is like, nope, nope, rules, procedures, ha <laughs> ha, what have we always done, ha <laughs> ha, we're fucking going bankrupt, help. To me, uh, this is brilliant design. Now, it doesn't look like much more than about a complicated plastic injection molding, but the octo valve and these other components, these things right here, this is, this is brilliant. This isn't a mechanical design. This is a, this is an electric circuit board that, uh, that someone has just puffed up and put together. So when you look at this stuff from just the outside, you can't really tell much. So these things have all been CT scanned. By CT scanning, it means I, I can go and I can look inside. What's going on inside this thing? Now, the actual octo valve is still being x-rayed because that's what a CT scan is. And so I don't have it here with me, but you have to really uh, see how this thing works. Um, and the only way that you can see it is either by taking it apart and looking at it, or better yet, take a picture or an x-ray, shift the uh, valve. It, it has four basic sections. Shift the valve, and then you can see lots of stuff. And then if you have all the rest of the uh, stuff that goes with it, so this is where right here is where the octo valve is located. And then these are the two electric motors that, uh, or pumps rather, that, uh, uh, that, that drive the whole system. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We thought that the um, uh, super bottle was brilliant. This is way better because this will give you extended range. Heating and cooling uh, sucks a lot of energy out of the um, product, out of the batteries. And uh, this, this makes a gigantic difference between this and, and uh, PTC heaters, uh, the little electric heaters that the people are putting in. And then having a look at the Jaguar I-Pace that has the um, heat pump, uh, sad. Uh, it, it's uh, sad. There's two points to address here. The first, of course, being that the octo valve truly is a major, major innovation. The Model Y, which is about 10% larger and heavier, literally 10% more massive, it weighs more than the Model 3, somehow has an almost identical range. Almost all of this range improvement has come from the octo valve heating and cooling system. This is a staggeringly important innovation. If you understand physics, you'll get this. And if you don't, sorry. The second and incredibly important point was the way that Sandy Munro referred to the octo Octo valve heating and cooling system as a scaled up circuit board. This is the exact same terminology Elon Musk used a few days ago on a podcast referring to their gigafactory designs. You can think of like a factory like a CPU or like a microchip or something like that. And you, you know, you bring the circuits closer together, you increase the, increase the clock speed, and then you can calculate some theoretical limits for the output of a, you know, a given silicon fabrication uh, technology. And I think the same is true of factories. So if you actually look at the volumetric efficiency and the velocity of, of automotive factories there. Volumetric efficiency is extremely low. The speed is much slower than walking speed. Now, if you don't understand physics, computer science, etc., this is probably a little bit over your head. I'm sorry, I don't have time to explain here. But just get this. Elon Musk and Sandy Munro are both thinking about products, procedures, manufacturing, everything from the atoms up. None of this BS convention, no, 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 no. Go down to the atoms, put your engineering brain on and think from there. So you're saying that basically the Octavalve completely outdoes the, the Jaguar I-Pace. Absolutely. Not only that, the Jaguar I-Pace is like about four times the amount of um, space claim. The amount of space you have to claim inside the vehicle in order to put it together. And it's all, here's one part over there, here's a part over here, here's a part down here. This thing is all all together. So that's better uh, because everything then is instantaneous. Um, everything's close together, so I don't have wire harnesses. I mean, e even as it is right now, the difference between um, Tesla's uh, wire harnesses, especially the high voltage lines, and everybody else's is like night and day. There's so much, uh, so much more harnessing and whatnot on every other vehicle. It doesn't matter which one it is. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> we're selling the, uh, we're selling this reports, right? Not one North American car company has purchased the product. However. The Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, and even one European company, they're buying it. That, that kind of scares me. <laughs> That's a very politically correct way of Sandy saying, what the f are you idiots doing? Seriously, let's think about this for a moment. How could any automotive OEM on planet Earth not know what Tesla's doing? 
and not be very curious about it. Like seriously, how dumb do you have to be as a company not to go, hey, um, yeah, Munroll and Associates, you know all that stuff that Tesla's doing way better than us? Can you give us those reports so we can copy it? That'd be a great idea. We'd like to know how to not suck shit at heating and cooling our vehicles. We'd like to know how to not suck shit at safety. We'd like to know how to not suck shit. You get the point, right? Why are they not buying these reports? Spoiler alert, because they're idiots and they're going bankrupt. I haven't heard anything from anybody else over here. I have from my friends in Toyota and Honda and Hyundai and Nissan and, uh, and others. They've sent me a little notes, but, uh, but not... Uh, not from Ford, not from GM. Hmm, why does that sound familiar, Ford and GM? I kind of feel like I've already made a video discussing these two companies and how f they are. I'll tell you one thing uh, <laughs> that I found out. Tesla lies. You, you probably don't believe this, but Tesla lies. They understate continuously, continuously. We've been doing testing and whatnot. And uh, they say, oh yeah, we're using this. And then we go over with our little spectrometer and go, beep, oh no it ain't. That is uh, super deluxe stuff. I mean, they, they understate a lot. What a luxury for Tesla to be in such a position of strength that they can sandbag and understate the specs and the quality of their products because hey, why not? Hope you guys have found this video insightful. I really do recommend watching the full video, link in description. I'm Stephen Mark Ryan. This is Solving the Money Problem and I love you all. And don't forget your free stocks with Weeble and Steak. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And of course, if you have any ideas for future videos, let me know. I read all your comments. P.S. If you're still watching, you're awesome. If you'd like early access, exclusive videos, regular Q&As, our private Discord server and more, consider supporting the channel at patreon.com slash solving the money problem so I can keep creating content for you guys. There's a link in the description. You can now also become a member of the channel for some exclusive perks. To learn more, click the join button next to subscribe. And don't don't forget to check out our merch store. Either way, the best form of support is you being here and watching, so thanks again.